Hello, everybody. Welcome to the County Seat. This week, I'm your host, Chad Booth. We're bringing you the show from the Utah Association of Counties headquarters in Murray, Utah. And we are going to discuss today um, wild horses. Do you realize it's been almost a year to the day since we last discussed this on the show? And the whole world seems different than it was. So how different is the horse situation? And all of those milestones that were made and we talked about a year ago, how are they shaping up? That's going to be the topic of our conversation, but let's give you a little bit of a panoramic view of the situation on the ground right now. Here's Derek Dassett. It all takes money, it all takes cooperation from all the different agencies and, you know, some semblance of common sense and accountability. And right now that, that seems to be lacking in a lot of these different groups that, you know, they just want to scream, let them be free. And they just don't understand what free means on the range. The Public Lands Policy Coordinating Office of the State of Utah is out documenting the impacts of the wild horses near the Frisco Herd Management Area. We're able to show the range condition with our 360 camera, and it shows the stud piles that are left around uh, areas like these springs and um, on the range. And it also gives us a good idea of um, the size of the herds uh, on camera and as we drive by them on the roads. The most important information we can gather from the GPS and the video data is um, to be able to tie those together and kind of show where the herds are roaming to when we see them in real time and the condition of those areas. All these horses that are out here came from ranchers that were breeding them for the cavalry, they're breeding them for the freight industry that was out here. Uh, it's gone from need to have horses to just a want or a, a desire to have horses as kind of a luxury item. So that uh, market changed. Uh, when we had so many horses out here in the West, it was because horses sold for $125 to $200 a head. Cattle at the time were selling for $10 to $15 a head. So we love to have them here, but we also have the new commodity animals are the sheep and the cattle. And uh, that's what we need to have a balance in the numbers there. The passage of the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrow Act of 1971 protected the horse and left their management to the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. Now, wild horses can be found on public lands across 10 western states on 177 herd management areas, or HMAs, covering some 26.9 million acres of public lands. Estimated populations of wild horses and burros nationwide are 95,000 animals and the appropriate management level, or AML, is a population of around 27,000 animals. In Utah, the population of wild horses and burros is 5,746 animals, with an appropriate management level of 1,956. We haven't run cattle here for five years. There's not been a cow here. So these tracks that are doing this digging is all horse tracks. When we exceed the appropriate management level, then that's when we start seeing these impacts. And a lot of these areas we're seeing three, four, five hundred percent over appropriate management level. And if a rancher uh, were to go over his appropriate management level, his appropriate number of livestock in one of these um, allotments, uh, even one or two percent, they're at risk of losing their permit to be on those allotments. Not unlike other wild animals, the horses don't always stay in their HMA, sometimes wandering onto a rancher's allotment and taking advantage of what was put there for the cows. They're moving down on our area, so whenever we turn water down into those other troughs, the horses follow that water. Or they're staying up here digging this up. If I had the, the wand, you know, the magic wand to, to fix all things, I would bring the the numbers down to appropriate management level and then I keep them there. The tricky part about it is that the number grows every year at about 20 percent, creating a huge task for the Bureau of Land Management when it comes to keeping herd sizes where they need to be. Reducing populations on the range will ultimately require huge gathers, placing as many horses into the wild horse adoption program as possible and sending the rest to live in long-term holding. We'll discuss the costs and why obtaining appropriate management levels now is so important. 
For the County Seat, I'm Derek Dowsett. Well, that sets the table for a good conversation. We'll pick up that conversation when we come back on the County Seat. Welcome back to the County Seat. We are uh, having a conversation today about wild horses and kind of an update. Joining us for the conversation from the Public Lands Policy Coordinating Office is a consultant, Reg Johnson. Thank you, Reg, for joining us. The director of the Utah Wild Horse and Burrow Program from the BLM, Gus War, and a commissioner and rancher from Beaver County, Tammy Pearson. Thank you all for making the time to get all the way here, particularly you, Tammy. It was a bit of a drive. Last time we had a conversation uh, on this show, we were discussing four basic tenets of the path forward. And we talked about targeted gathers and, and removal from the HMAs. We talked about permanent sterilizations. We talked about temporary darting uh, with PZP um, and approaching the HMA decisions on the local level and give a little more autonomy to how things are handled. What's changed? A number of things have changed. Um, you know, BLM has actually formally proposed to Congress a new proposal, which actually discusses gathering, uh, you know, 20 to 30,000 animals a year. It discusses increased uh, fertility control, uh, a number of things, uh, increased adoptions through our adoption incentive program, and there's a lot of moving parts. And as long as the funding keeps coming in, I, I see some progress moving in the right direction. Are, are we producing that many new horses on the range that we could actually take twenty to 30,000 off the range each yes, year? Yes, we are. Nationwide, uh, as of March 1st, 2020, the estimated population was 95,000 across the country. And they're supposed to be at? Uh, 28,000, so we're three times where we should be. Even, even in Utah, our estimated population for Utah was 5,700. Um, and we should be around 2,000. And if you add this year's babies onto there, for Utah, for example, there's another 1,600 animals. So it's, we are there, it's, there's lots of animals. Tammy, what kind of impact is this growth having on, on rangeland and wildlife habitat? Well, it's, you know, it's always kind of the same story. There's always more horses than what are supposed to be on the HMA. So they're, they're doing a lot of, um, heavy impact on those areas and then you add the drought to it and the water conditions on the springs and riparian areas it's just it's a huge impact and and now uh, what we're really concerned is that we're at that breaking point or beyond the breaking point of where we can't even gather the full crop the annual full crop and so you know we've been preaching that same story for however many years and so I really appreciate what the BLM have done and you know we've worked with them with the Path Forward group on, a, on that proposal to increase the gathers. Uh, one of the biggest issues that I see with that is that right now there isn't even contractors enough to, to gather that many but I'm hoping that they're working towards getting that done. So Reg, you have been tracking this very closely, um, you know, through PLIPCO and your association with Ag and Food for a few months and everything, and you stayed right on the edge of this. Last year, we talked about the fact that the herds were reaching a tipping point. Right. Have we tipped? We're right at the cusp. And if we don't get ahead of it right away, we will be over that tipping point. And so it's going, uh, to, it's going to tip the wrong way. It's not it, tipping right, the right way. Right. Um, we've been doing some new modeling with uh, both the Path Forward and uh, the group called Freeze, um, which is a, a group of about 100 organizations that are working on this issue. And uh, the new modeling says, you know, if we don't get up around 25, 30,000 horses gathered a year, uh, we're we're gonna be behind the eight ball and we'll never get ahead of it. And that, that's a challenge. I think the most BLM's ever gathered is around 20,000 in a year. Yep. So uh, it's gonna be a challenge to get the contractors in place, to get the uh, contracts in place where we have short-term and long-term holding available enough to bring that many horses off the range. And uh, the state office has been great. Our Utah state office and BLM and Gus have been great of working at pulling horses off the range and at the same time trying to get more contraception on the range. And if we can do that, combine those two things, then that will really help us reduce the population uh, long term so that we don't have to continually bring off so many horses and put them in long term holding. But it, it's going to require that 
combination of contraception and removals. So, Gus, 30,000 horses, if you gather them, where are you going to put them? Good question. Um, BLM is actually just opening up uh, new, what we call off-range corrals this year, a new one in uh, Wyoming, a new one in Utah. Uh, we just uh, doubled our holding capacity in Axtell, went from a 1,000 head facility to a 2,250 capacity. And so we're boistering up that. There's going to be a new solicitation go out this fall for additional up to 10,000 animals in holding. But if you're pulling 30,000 a year, the increase of, of pastured horses um, is, is excel I believe it's accelerating beyond the lifespan of the horse, right? So, I mean, you just keep falling further and further behind. Um, the part of our report to Congress is we will have 100,000, 150,000 animals in pastures by the time we get to where we want to be. So it's projected that our program is going to uh, double and triple in cost and in holding because we have nowhere else to go with them. And so they're going to have to go into those facilities. And that's one of the critical aspects of getting uh, contraception on the range, both short-term and long-term contraception. And BLM's been working on uh, IUDs, uh, a kind of a one-shot, long-term uh, contraception. Uh, we have Gonacon out there that if we can get a booster, we can maybe get you know five to six years effectiveness out of it. So it's gone beyond the PZP, which we've talked about in the past, which is you, know, you have to give it every year or every two years. So they're making some efforts on that, but we really need to boost up that contraception aspect. Quick answer before we take a break. There are a lot of adversaries that, that have harangued this conversation for years. I've been to some of the uh, horse and burrow summits and I've heard them talk. And uh, are they changing their tune? Is, there, is, is that moving at all? We, we've looked out on that. Um, I would have never b believed it, but we have friends in high places like Chris Stewart and that that asked us to sit at the same table and breathe the same oxygen as those people which I thought was an impossible thing. But um, we've got groups like the Humane Society and the ASPCA and Return to Freedom, and these kind of groups that are finally coming to see the effects of what all the protests have done. So now we have that huge uh, number on the ground and they're willing to work with us and have been working with us now for, what, almost three years uh, to try and reverse that exponential growth. And they're the ones putting a lot of the effort into the modeling that's indicating that removals have to be a key part of this, especially in the first you know, five to seven years. If we don't bring down the numbers and then get contraception on, we'll never get ahead of the game. So kudos to them. Uh, and it also helps if we have those groups messaging out to the other animal advocacy groups. Good, we're going to take a break. We're going to pick up this conversation when we come back. You're watching the county seat topic, wild horses. Welcome back to the county seat. We are having a conversation about where we've moved on the wild horse situation since last year at this time. Uh, joining our panel discussion is David Ewer, who's the director of School Institutional Trust Lands here in the state of Utah. David, thank you for taking time to join us today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people look at this whole battle that's waged for decades and they go, this is an issue between the ranchers, their rangeland and the BLM and occasionally fish and wildlife. But sitla has got a stake in this too. What is your concern with the situation? Well, <clears throat> we're in a business of making money and we make money off selling grazing leases to, to the ranchers. And when we have a flock or a herd of horses, whatever you want to classify them, on our ground eating the grass that the cows would normally eat, eating the grass that we would normally be paid for by the rancher, we have to cut back the animal units in there and the horses take what profit we do have off, off the grass and the, and the grazing from the, from the ranchers and they run down the road with it. It's, it's something that the ranchers come to us all the time and say, you know, if I had 100 AUMs or animal units um, 10 years ago, I'm virtually down to 50 right now. And I'm not going to pay for the other 50 the horses are, are, uh, are eating. And so 
to try and be fair with everybody, we cut back the animal units and, and we take less money for our, our grass and the horses walk off with it. And it, it's not fair. And I will also say that the 27,000 or 29,000 that, that Gus just spoke about, I believe that they're using that 29,000 only on BLM ground. That's, that's the way they're, they're trying to compare it. But at the same time, because we do not have fences around all of our scattered sections, they are also eating ours. And I said a couple of years ago, I said, BLM, get your darn horses off our ground. It was a little bit tougher than that. I use a little more colorful language. But it still, it, it still goes right back to the fact that the horses are eating school kids' They've invited themselves in for school lunch, and they're not even leaving a tip. And yes, that's a very good way of putting it. And the fact is, for every dollar that they eat, that's a dollar that we can't put in the trust fund to help educate our children. And it's not only the school kids, it's University of Utah, Utah State, School of Mines, and a lot of other organizations that, that own, or they're called the beneficiaries, that own the 3.4 million acres that we... Okay, Gus, can you go on to Sitlow Lands for a gather? Or you bet. You bet, and we, we actually really try to focus on those lands because, you know, just like animals that move off of public land onto private ground, you know, we want to get those back in their boundaries. But like Dave was saying, you know, state sections of land fall right within a lot of times right in the middle of our herd management areas, and so we have to manage and, and cooperatively work with them to try to make sure the impacts are as least, uh, you know, impacting them as possible. So. I'm, I'm sure that Mark Wench out in the West Range would think that his, his grazing allocation is every bit as important oh, as Sidlis. Sure. <laughs> and he's one of the people that we've cut back. Yep. Uh -huh. and, and Mark has been good to work with us because he realizes it's out of our hands. Um, and also let me say this, I believe that in the last two years that the attitude of the BLM in gathering the horses has changed remarkable. I really admonish you guys <clears throat> and thank you guys for what you've done. Um, a good share of the battle that we're both fighting together now is in Congress. And as I've said before, one thing Congress has an abundance of is ignorance. And the fact is they do not know what they're doing and they're going on emotion. And you cannot govern this nation on emotion. It has to be on facts and figures and, and do things right. And, there's very few people representing the west side of the United States that have enough votes to try and change some of these things. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to take another quick break, come back for our last uh, segment of the show, and we'll pick up the conversation there. You're watching The County Seat. The topic is wild horses. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. It's going to get good. Welcome back to the County Seat, talking about wild horses today. You know, as I've been listening to this conversation, I'm trying to think, what would the viewers be asking questions about? And, and there'd be some of them, I don't know that I can identify with all of yours of the show, but I think one of the questions is, if you're trying to put 30,000 horses away for a year and you can only adopt a portion of them and you have to keep doubling the size of your paid uh, herds, how much does it cost to feed a horse for his life? Um, for, for its life, I mean, we're, you're talking over 30 years, I mean, it could be, depending on how long they live, I mean, we're talking thousands of dollars. Uh, and, you know, the, that's one of the biggest issues BLM has right now is we're spending over $50 million a year on just caring for the horses we have in holding right now. And so and if, if you we, double that, it's going to be 100 million. It's going to be 100 million, and then it's going to be 150 million. So dollars is a huge factor in where we move next. If we don't get the funding from Congress, we will not move this program off the dime that's on right now. Reg, what does your crystal ball say? What's, what, how, if, if Congress hired you as a consultant, because because I watch, I watch your posts, and you're on top of this all the time. What would you tell them? Uh, the critical thing is to fund, give, them the, give BLM the funding they need up front. Because if we don't get ahead of it right away, then it just gets more expensive. And uh, do as many removals as we can right away, get the holding space put in place right away. If we can get up to where we could do 30 to 40,000 removals a year, now remember, you're still gonna have 20,000 horses born every year for the first couple years. So that's where you have to really spend up front to get ahead of this. 
And it's one of the few programs that I would recommend to Congress that you heavily invest in up front so that you can get ahead of the game because uh, the cost long term uh, will be, the cost savings long term will be substantial. I think last figures I saw was around 40,000 to 50,000 for the life of a, defeat it for the lifetime. Originally, wasn't the program in, you put them up for adoption three times and then you sell them in the market? Wasn't that originally how it was handled? So that was a 2004 amendment to the Wild Horse and Burrow Act. It's oh. called our sell authority and we can sell horses. Uh, but there are limitations attached to that, uh, meaning that they're not going to go to slaughter or go to some commercial exploitation. It's challenging. Very challenging. Challenging. Okay, gentlemen, uh, 15 seconds, David, final thoughts. I think if the American public really understood how much money it was costing us, they would be changing a few of their philosophies. But if you took that hundred and twenty or $150,000 of horses, and charged them $3 a day for private pasture, well, well over a billion dollars a year you'd be putting into horses. Okay, Gus, final thoughts. Um, we'd love to see people come out. You know, one of the tools we have to place excess horses is through our adoption program and our sale program. And you've made that more streamlined, right? We have. We moved, we jumped to over 7,000 animals last year. You know, if we can keep doing that, that's going to help. It's not the answer, but it's going to help, uh, definitely. Okay, Reg, last 15 second thought. So the state of Utah is supportive of the wild horses on the range, but they need to be managed like all the other animals on the range. Uh, we manage livestock uh, to specific numbers, specific dates, specific areas. We do the same with wildlife. We need to do the same with wild horses. Excellent. Gentlemen, this has been a great conversation. Tammy, thank you for joining us too over there. And thank you for joining the county seat. Remember, local government's where your life happened. Be involved, be part of the solution, and be sure to share this uh, content with your friends on social media. Follow us, you'll learn a lot. We'll see you next week on The County Seat. Thank you for watching The County Seat. Be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications to keep up to date on the program and happenings around Utah.